Coming up on DTNS, the colonial pipeline attack is resolved, plus what a U.S. executive order on security means and a way to let paralyzed people type with their minds. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 13th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Austin, Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about uh, Disney's new streaming numbers, how they compare to Netflix, uh, the new CDC mask guidelines, and why Justin is willing to go inside for a paid event. Mm -mm. It's amazing, folks. Get that wider conversation on Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Microsoft is shutting down its Azure blockchain service on September 10th with only pre-existing deployments supported until that date. Microsoft is suggesting that users start migrating to an alternative, recommending consensus quorum blockchain service. Azure Blockchain as a Service, or BAAS, launched back in 2015 on the Ethereum platform with consensus with a certified blockchain marketplace as a short-term goal, but there's no official word on the reason for the shutdown. Mm, not a good sign, though. Italian antitrust regulators have fined Google $123 million, saying it abused its dominant market position with Android Auto by restricting the electric car charging app JuicePass from being on the platform. As part of the ruling, Google must allow Juice Pass on Android Auto and provide the same interoperability to other third-party developers. A new national blueprint in South Korea outlines plans to invest $450 billion to build the world's biggest chip-making base by 2030, involving 153 companies. Samsung Electronic will boost spending 30% to $151 billion by 2030, with H, sorry, S. K. Hynix committing at $97 billion to expanding facilities, in addition to $106 billion plans for four new chip fabs. Roku announced it'll launch its original programming on the Roku channel in the U.S., U.K., and Canada on May 20th. This is the original programming, not the stuff that's provided by other great people like Rotten Tomatoes. The initial slate will be 30 shows Roku previously acquired from Quibi, with plans to roll out more acquired content throughout 2021. Intel and QTech demonstrated a first in quantum computing, high fidelity two qubit control using its Horse Ridge cryogenic control processor, opening the door to processors that integrate the electronics and the quantum chip on the same die. Previous quantum systems were often bottlenecked by using room temperature electronics to manage a supercooled quantum processor. Oh, folks, the fuel is flowing again. Can you feel it? Can you feel it under <laughs> your feet, East Coast? Colonial Pipeline, uh, which had shut down its 5,500-mile fuel pipeline in the eastern U.S., not 500,000 miles, after a ransomware attack, reopened the pipeline Wednesday afternoon. Colonial says it will take, quote, several days for product delivery to return to normal. So by this weekend, service should be back to normal. It's going to take a while for everything to catch up in the system. Bloomberg sources say that Colonial paid a $5 million ransom to unlock its systems, which is surprising to some because CNN and Reuters reported Colonial was not going to pay the ransom. In fact, CNN even said Colonial had managed to retrieve the most important data without having to worry about ransomware. If you've got proper backups and can restore, often that is the case. It does not appear still that control systems were ever directly affected by this. Security reporter Kim Zetter, who does a great job on this stuff, uh, suggested from a source that the shutdown happened not only to prevent the ransomware from spreading from Colonial's business systems into the control systems, but also to keep the systems of other companies in the distribution network, like tank farms, safe from the ransomware. So it wasn't just Colonial's own systems. The Associated Press cited the author of an independent audit of Colonial Pipeline from 2018, just a few years ago, as finding atrocious information management practices and, quote, a patchwork of poorly connected and secured systems. Uh, so that author saying, not a big surprise to me that Colonial got hit by this, uh, but we still don't know if they really did pay the $5 million. Kind of looks like maybe they did. Yeah, that's a very interesting question because uh, when we get into the idea of ransomware, which I think, aside from great shows like this, is undercovered uh, in terms of, uh, of what a lot of the 
you know, the effect that it can have. We should probably have a better idea, not only in terms of business standards, but also our public response to how these kinds of threats should be uh, uh, should be dealt with. Uh, uh, I'm glad they got it reopened. Uh, obviously, we're going to see a spike in Google searches for how do I return a bag of gas for a full refund? But uh, <laughs> you know, we will. Uh, uh, Is it legal to sell a bag of gas? Yeah. Yeah. Current going price for a grocery bag of gas uh, uh, will will certainly be be entered. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I wish that we could say this is going to be the most audacious ransomware attack that we'll see this year, but I don't think I could do it with a straight face. It sounds like, based on this independent audit, that Colonial Pipeline uh, had a lot to learn about being a little bit more secure. The word's atrocious when, yes. you know, talking about a patchwork of connected and s supposed to be secure system that were, in fact, not. So that's one issue. I do think the other issue is, and I understand why Colonial Pipeline, if a ransom was paid five million at that, why the company didn't want to say so, right? Because it's like you're, you know, it's it's uh, you're sort of admitting that you needed to do that and you weren't already up to speed, and kind of encourages more ransomware attacks. But it would seem that this shouldn't be a question that sort of like did they or didn't they? I mean, the folks who wanted that money would probably have some way to prove that they got it, right? Yeah. I mean, as far as keeping it out of imitators, on the one hand, not having it public does maybe keep, you know, a few people from believing that it's widespread and trying it. But if dark side, the 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 attackers that are are thought to have done this did get five million out of colonial, dark side knows. And yeah. so do a lot of other people on the dark web who follow, you know, what dark side does. I'll be yeah. honest, uh, Bloomberg source says that five million isn't really a lot for usually something this size would be 25 to 35 million. So if they right. did pay five million, I think they got off cheap. And it may be that Darkseid didn't mean to go after Colonial. I'm, I'm still holding that out as a possibility that this was accidental, that it was targeted at something else. Uh, and maybe because Colonial's network is so atrocious, uh, yeah. it spread uh, worse that, than was intended or that uh, they they overshot. And and realize, oh wait, we don't want that kind of attention because uh, ransomware folks don't want a lot of attention. They want qu to be quietly paid because they don't yes. want law enforcement targeting them. They don't want mm. people to know about them. Uh, they just want to go about their business and make money. As Darkside has said in its public statement on Monday, that that's why they do this. So they're not social activists. They're they're trying to just rake in dollars. Yeah. Straight crooks. Uh, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about a story a little bit later that gets into some of these issues. But for right now, I would just say if you are a major company, I feel like we should record an infomercial. If you or someone you love has an atrocious information management practice or a patchwork of poorly connected and secured systems, now is the time to invest <laughs> in InfoSec. Yeah. Uh, as we have said over and over, what Justin just said is entirely true. You will pay later. At some point, yes. if you don't pay, pay now. now. Pay now to good actors that will make these glaring holes in your system harder to exploit. Yeah. Tesla's Elon Musk issued a statement uh, announcing the company will stop taking Bitcoin 49 days after they announced that they would accept it for the purchase of cars. Tesla holds about $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin, and Musk says the company will not sell any more of it. In the statement, Musk said the company is concerned about the energy use of Bitcoin mining, especially where power comes from coal. Quote Musk, we intend to use it for transactions as soon as mining transactions are uh, uh, transitions to a more sustainable energy. We are also looking at other cryptocurrencies that use less than 1% of Bitcoin's energy to transaction. Quote. This, this is weird to me. Uh, well, okay, it's it's Tesla and it's Elon Musk, but, but 49, <laughs> 49 days ago, and we we talked about this. Oh, Tesla's going to start, you know, accepting Bitcoin as payment for vehicles. Okay, sure, fine. Uh, that didn't seem too weird at the time. It's just an option. It's not required. But 49 days ago, the company would be aware that there is a, there's at least a conversation, not everybody agrees on how bad it is, but there's been a conversation going on for some time about energy consumption from 
mining Bitcoin. So for the company to say, you know, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> we just read this article and boy, it seems like maybe this is a little bit too, you know, uh, t t tough on, on the energy sector here. We're going to pause this whole thing until we can figure out a better idea. That is just not ring yeah. true to me at all. It's not like, y'all, I was just on Medium and you have no idea how much yeah. it like. Yeah, like this, it's that, just, it's, what, it's what that's changed, insane. Justin, what changed right. in the past 49 days? So let's understand that Elon Musk indeed is capricious and very much a subscriber to the move fast, whether or not it's rather, you'd rather take this moment of embarrassment or backtracking than double down on a, a mistake. This could easily have just been grime showing him a TikTok explainer that made him type up this uh, statement and post it on Twitter. However, if I were to guess, I would say that part of it is Tesla's mission is clean energy. If this is something that they materially and they could only mean Elon Musk or other people in the company believe that the idea of Bitcoin is environmentally unsafe begins to erode that part of the brand, then now it is brand brand detrimental and you'd rather cut it off here uh, than go on later and say, well, OK, well, if Tesla really does care about clean energy, then why are they taking Bitcoin? They'd rather end it there. So what, what I guess what you're saying is 49 days ago, they didn't think there'd be as much backlash as they saw. That, yes. It's not uh, that they didn't know there was an yeah. issue. They just didn't think it would be as big of a deal. If it becomes a problem to the brand, then yes, it now mm -hmm. becomes something that, that, they need to, it, that they need to react to in a way that they wouldn't before. Well, that That's might a be guess. the only thing that That's explains it. Well, speaking of currencies, remember Facebook's Libra? It was going to mm. be backed by a basket of stable currencies and operate under a Swiss payment license. Mm. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Remember how nearly every government in the world lashed out against it as they felt it threatened to undermine government plans for digital currencies? Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yep, yep. So that all happened. And now it's not Libra. It's the Diem Association. And it's not backed by a basket of currencies, just the U.S. dollar. And now Diem has withdrawn its application for a Swiss payment license, moved headquarters from Switzerland to Washington, D.C., and partnered with California's Silvergate Bank. Yes, a bank. Silvergate will issue Diem's coins and also run its blockchain-based payment system. So, to sum this all up, Facebook's worldwide Libra system for the unbanked is now Diem, which is a U.S. dollar stablecoin run by a bank. <laughs> uh, I, I admire their commitment to the bit, I guess. You know, like, hey, but we got this thing. It might still be good for something. Uh, what if we yeah, add Silvergate you, you with it in California? You don't want to work with us? You, you it, don't either? It is, it is a pretty funny how it started, how it's going. Me, <laughs> yeah. right? Like It went from this very ambitious idea that was not only backlash from countries, but also from people as the idea of Facebook being... It you know a, a part of some gigantic currency was was an unpopular one as many Facebook moves at least initially are, but uh, uh, I think Tom you said something in our in our pre show that I found fascinating that you know this is not a government backed currency but it is a stable one backed by a bank and and tagged to the U S dollar and and uh, you you made mention that you're bullish on the idea of country backed coins becoming more of a thing. Yeah, when when I say I'm bullish, I mean every country is going to try to have their own backed currency, which to me explains why they were so angry with the idea of Libra. Every country wants to have a stable coin that they issue. And and don't get me wrong, they don't want to do a speculative coin like Bitcoin or even Ethereum. They want to do just a digital currency that they can issue uh, and it will be available instantly and it will it will smooth the wheels of commerce within their nation. Yeah. The Bahamas already has it. China is the farthest along, but the US, Europe, and pretty much every country you can think of uh, is in some way planning to have their own version of a digital version of their, of their own currency. So that's to me why Libra got beat down. Uh, and, uh, and this is where it ended up. Uh, we'll see if it's good for anything. Folks, you can join in the conversation in our Discord. Uh, you got some ideas about uh, what Diem might be good for? Let us know there in the Discord. And you can join that by linking a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. 
A new U.S. executive order authorizes the U.S. Commerce Department to create cybersecurity standards for companies that sell software services to the federal government. So this is this is pretty standard stuff. If you're going to sell something to us, it has to meet these criteria. It also implements standards for quicker incident reporting uh, when something happens again on a on a federal network uh, or in software that is used by a federal uh, agency, and standards of response. Uh, so how those responses are made. And it tries to remove contractual barriers that prevent communication between vendors and investigating agencies while still protecting user privacy. There were a lot of blanket clauses that said the vendor won't tell you any of this stuff that were getting in the way of these investigations. So it's trying to thread that needle. The order creates a cyber safety review board. This will be part of the Department of Homeland Security. It'll be made up of representatives of all the three-letter agencies, DOD, DOJ, NSA, FBI, also a four-letter agency, CISA, and private security companies. So they're going to bring some folks from the industry on this. That board will review incidents that meet a certain level, starting with the solar winds attack from December. This is being positioned in a lot of stories as being a response to Colonial. The announcement may be a response to Colonial. <laughs> the executive order is a response to solar winds. The order also implements several security standards for vendors and users of software and services used by the federal government. Uh, some of the rec rules require things like encryption and multi-factor authentication. They were often required anyway, but this says everybody's got to do this, no excuses. Uh, there are also provisions in here to direct the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, to draw up minimum standards for vendors. The rules only apply to government, but the hope is that requiring these standards in software will cause the companies that sell to the government to implement them for all their customers and therefore having a knock-on effect of improving security in general. Yeah, these kind of requirements are not new when it comes to government contracts. Government contracts come with all sorts of different little, uh, uh, some security-related, uh, you know, physical security or bookkeeping, accounting-related requirements just to make dealing with our federal government or local or state government uh, easier and more uh, uniform. That being said, this is not only needed, I think it should even go further. Uh, I, I, I believe that we should have some kind of public watchdog, and let's start with just government contractors and specifically some of these companies that basically create the backbone of our of our industry and utility and say, hey, look, if you get hit by a cyber attack, number one, here's all the things you need to do beforehand. But if you do, there's going to be a mandatory reporting period for which the public needs to know because these are public funds that are going into it. I, I, I think that uh, there is no security through obscurity, and that even counts on uh, whether or not you are paying a ransom. We need to know everything, every step of the way, the, the information benefits everybody. And if it starts with government contracts, then that's better. But I would love to see this just become privacy standard or, or, or just reporting standard for everybody because these ransomware tags are not going away. We have a brand name in ransomware as a service with Darkside. Th this is a brand now. Like, like that's, that's how bad it is. Yeah, I, I, part of my brain still pretends that, you know, we're in the Nixon administration and executive orders are, are only used for certain things and reconciliation is in the way you pass legislation. That part of my brain still thinks like, oh yeah, what you're talking about is legislation. Uh, and, and I don't know if that's still what it is or not, but an executive order says, this is what our federal government's going to do. And legislation is, hey, you know what? This is what everybody should do. We should have some minimum standards out there. The executive order seems to be well received by the security industry. Uh, if anything, I've seen people saying about damn time, like like this is a little late, but better late than never. Uh, but I, I think, yeah, I think there this could also create some momentum towards legislation that says, hey, let's have some minimum security standards in general out there, even if it's just about reporting. Yeah, look, I, I, I think the legislation is a is a more tricky subject because then you got to figure it. You got to cross I's and, and dot T's. Right. But like uh, if you are just in talking about these companies that are dealing with the government, uh, it, it is it is certainly responsible for them to do it. And the reason why you can I, I'm fine with doing it as an executive order is that what you want is 
companies not to cheap out. Companies not to say, all right, well, we got this money coming in. Do we really need to implement all these things? It's going to cost the contractors coming in. They know we're getting federal money. They're going to soak us for it. Do we need to spend it? Yes. Yes, you do. And and I'm glad that it's getting coverage because of Colonial. But you're right. This is because of solar winds. The only reason why, I mean, this show would have covered it, but the only reason why it's getting a lot of other press coverage is because another larger thing happened that made a bunch of people run around with trash bags full of gas. That's why. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I this was going to get announced one way or another. The, the timing of the announcement may have been massaged a little to be like, hey, that let's get that EO ready for now, because now would yeah. be a good time to announce that. I could see that, maybe. Scientists from Stanford University published a paper in Nature called High Performance Brain-to-Text Communication via Handwriting. The paper describes brain-computer interface that reads uh, attempts at handwriting movements from neural activity in the motor cortex and uses a recurrent neural network trained to translate the brain's impulses into text in real time. Real time is the key, since previous attempts at things like controlling cursors or attempting to transcribe were fairly slow. The system was tried on a 65-year-old person paralyzed from the neck down. That person had two chips implanted in the motor cortex and was told to imagine writing with a pen on paper. The person was able to achieve 90 characters per minute, about 18 words, with 94.1% raw accuracy online and greater than 99% accuracy offline with a general purpose autocorrect. The average phone typing is about 23 words per minute if you want to compare the two, so in the same neighborhood. The team will conduct more trials to measure efficiency and safety and hope to be able to adapt the software to work with older implant systems. How about that? Yeah, though this is clever, right? Because it's saying instead of trying to guess what the person is thinking and turning it into words, let's hijack the system they already have. I, I, this would only work on people who already know how to type or, or write, but let's hijack that part of the brain because it's faster to interpret that part of the brain, apparently. Yeah, you know, I, I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine this week about the idea as we've gone through our last tech boom, some of the biggest follies have been where people tried to guess where the puck is going in, in the famous metaphor, but they wound up guessing where the puck was going in the next period, <laughs> not like in the next few seconds. And I think uh, uh, there has been a great amount of, of tremendous involve or a tremendous advancement in, in looking at what we have and just figuring out, okay, well, what can we do with this right now? And instead of trying to define an entire new dynamic for the next uh, uh, 10 years. And I think this is a great example, a, gr a great uh, uh, solution for something that is literally life-changing for the folks that would be able to interact with it. And, and it's just so fascinating um, that there can be a targeted part of the brain where it's like, this is the part of your brain that you're flexing when you are thinking about writing a word out, you know, or typing something and spelling it correctly. And to be able to, I mean, sure, you know, 90 characters per minute uh, is not a super fast uh, typing situation, but that is, that's incredible. I mean, I'm like, I want to try it. You know, this is not something that I need, but there are plenty of people who will really benefit from this. So it's just, it's, it's a really heartwarming um, advance. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it is. It, it, it's a little ways off from being practical still. Uh, but but yeah, it this is something that once they get it out of the lab, and it looks like there's no reason they shouldn't, it's just a matter yeah. of when, uh, will we'll change people's lives. Uh, well, this may or may not change your life. Uh, <laughs> depends on how much you like Grand Theft Auto. But Intel Labs showed off a new a convolutional network-based product called Enhancing Photorealism Enhancement. That's what it's called. That creates a photorealistic version of Grand Theft Auto V gameplay. The system uses a cityscapes data set that was built largely from German city streets, real ones, and was able to integrate geometric information from the game's G buffers. They use data like the distance between objects, in the game, distance between objects and a camera, quality of textures, the glossiness of a car, for example. The technique is not unlike upscaling that uses machine learning to bump up graphics to higher resolutions. Yeah, so they used the convolutional network in two different places uh, to train the algorithm to intercept 
the GTA actual uh, information and turn it into a better picture. In one place, they're taking all that geometric information that you're talking about, and they trained it to interpret that and, yeah. and reinterpret the image. And then in another place, they this was the more impressive part of the video for me, was how they were able to take the German data set, which is not the same pictures, right? These are just people in Germany. Right, like and it's go, Sunset Boulevard, not in and Germany. And go like, well, that's a bicyclist, and this is a yeah. bicyclist in GTA. That's close enough. Convolutional network, figure out how to make this one look more like that one, and it worked. I mean, this is... Uh, 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 fascinating. I, I, I really, really wonder. I love uh, uh, these kinds of, of proof of concepts and uh, uh, talk about something that I think is waiting for practical application. These kinds of networks. It's like one. We're, we're close. One of these days, over the next months or or, or years, we're going to see something that is very practical and relevant to our daily life, and we're going to be and and nothing will be the same. In the meantime. Driving around in GTA 5 could look like driving around in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. That that that's I don't know. I don't know if, if, if we somehow figured... the real thing is slightly less exciting. But <laughs> I also realistic. don't know if we've really if we really hunger for realism in certain things. Like, like <laughs> would you really want like a photorealistic Tom and Jerry, or would that just look horrifying? Right. Like, that would that would look like something on like Live Leak or like Faces of Death. Uh, if you look at this video, though, uh, I, I noticed that when you were side by side comparing the actual GTA 5 footage with the hyper realistic, uh, the, the photo realistic one, uh, you definitely are like, oh, yeah, that looks real. And GTA doesn't. When they go full screen, though, you start to see like, yeah, but I can tell that's not actually real. Like, I, I can tell it's a little bit computery. So it's not perfect, but it's really good. There's also a uh, a version trained on the Mapillary Vistas data set uh, instead of cityscapes that that shows more vibrant colors if you don't like the gray aspect uh, of the cityscapes data. So they even they even have a couple different takes on it. All right, Good let's stuff. check out the mailbag. This one comes in from Nick with a K. Nick says, I and most other PS5 owners love what the hardware is capable of and new features of the DualSense controller over what the DualShock 4 offered. But there's surprisingly massive number of PS5 owners and wannabe owners that hate the look of the PS5 hardware. People seem to really hate the black and white color scheme. It's at the point where there are third parties selling custom black side panels to replace the removable panels that come with the PS5 console, and people have been asking for an all black dual sense since the console was unveiled. Nick says, I'm personally indifferent to the color scheme on the console, but given how much grime the white sections of the dual sense can pick up, I'll be getting an all black dual sense ASAP. All right. Always good to get the insight from inside the community on that. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. If you have if you have insight for us, questions, comments, or all of the above, or something else, feedback at Daily Tech News Show is where to send that email. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Who will they include today? Why, well, it's Norm Fazekas, Scott Morris, and Cartond. Also, we have a brand new boss, and that boss's name is Dylan Davis. Dylan, you just started backing us on Patreon, and we're throwing you a party. Woo! Thank you. We need more people like Dylan. Be like Dylan. Be like Dylan. Yeah. yeah. Dylan Davis. Double Ds. This, this party that we're having right now could be for you. It could be right. your party. All you have to do is back us on Patreon. I've, right. got, I've got my drink in hand. I'm not yeah. wearing a mask per CDC guidelines. It's it's great in here. And, 24 know. hours in the future from right this second, it could be your name and line. It could be you. It could right be. Yeah. Go do yeah. it right now. It's your the party. The power <laughs> is inside you. <laughs> Uh, speaking of power, Justin Robert Young, always great to have you on the show. Uh, what's been going on since we saw you last? Oh, man, we have a, a great episode of the Politics, Politics, Politics podcast coming out tomorrow. Uh, the return of our great political triad, uh, myself, Andrew Heaton, Jen Briney. Uh, we talk about uh, the the question of the economy and, and something that that a lot of economists are are, are pouring over because we had a weaker than expected jobs report is the social safety net, which we extended throughout COVID creating a labor shortage. Uh, it, it is a great unifying uh, topic for me, the, the, the elections expert Heaton, the, the philosophy expert and Briny, the legislation expert to, to get into. And we talk about all of it on tomorrow's 
politics, politics, politics. The, man, Excellent. no, no lie. I was thinking about Jen Bridey when I was reading that executive order, which is like only a few pages. But just reading that executive order, I was like, oh my gosh, Jen does this for much longer things that are much more complicated. Like, it's total respect to Jen Bridey. She's, congressional she's an actual lunatic. Who, yeah, yeah. Uh, has, has just gotten to the end of reading the American Rescue Plan, uh, uh, and I think her brain <laughs> might have been melting out of her uh, ear when we were talking. <laughs> Uh, well, hopefully your brains aren't melting out of your ears, but we have been having such a great time with you with us, and we're going to do it all tomorrow. In fact, we're live Monday through Fridays, 4.30 p.m. Eastern for 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Bookmark it if you can't remember or tell a friend if you can. We'll be back tomorrow with Rob Dunwood and Len Peralta drawing the stories. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>